Ann Evers Hitz has a long interest in San Francisco history, its lore and its length. And I have a feeling knows where a few of the bodies are buried. Um, Anne is a graduate of UC Berkeley and she has her own consulting company. And she's the author of Lost Department Stories of San Francisco, which most of us seem to have shopped at, San Francisco's Ferry Building, and I would encourage any of you who come to visit San Francisco, put the ferry okay. building on your list. And she's also authored Emporium Department Store. And Anne is a descendant of the founder of what was my favorite store. Um, she's on the board of San Francisco Cisco City Guides, and she gives three tours, the ferry building, the west end of Golden Gate Park, and the one that I want to go on, which is 1850 San Francisco, the Paris of the Pacific. So please join me in a warm Golden Gate Breakfast Club. Welcome to author, historian, and fifth generation San Franciscan, Anne Evers Hitz. If I'm in a room, lately I haven't been giving Zoom presentations. I've been in, in actual rooms, which was very fun after the pandemic. This, this book was actually published in March of 2020. How's that for a wonderful pub month? I had nine different uh, presentations scheduled in person and everything just stopped. But I, I didn't mind because, I mean, everybody was in the same situation. <clears throat> And I pivoted to Zoom like everybody else. That was a overused uh, expression, but our term, but um, I gave over 20 different presentations to clubs and everything. And it was pretty fun because they needed to keep their members engaged. Everybody was stuck at home and I, I was giving presentations all over the place. So um, anyway, um, as I as was noted, I wrote some other books, and my first book was on the Emporium Department Store. And the reason I got inspired to do that was, um, as Susan said, my great great grandfather F. W. Dorman was one of the founders. And as I was winding up my corporate career, I thought yeah, I could do a book. You know, the kids are through college, and why don't I do something that's uh, well, corporate work was fun, but uh, a little less renewed. Uh, writing a history book isn't the way to put your kids through college. Let me put it that way. But <laughs> but it was a lot of fun, and I met a lot of interesting people. Um, and one example of how I knew there was this vein of nostalgia was um, Leah Garchik put a note in her column saying that I was going to be doing a book signing. And I thought maybe, you know, 20 people would show up at most. I got there, there were over 60 people and many of them were former Emporium employees and they brought memorabilia. They were wearing their little um, uh, badges from being employees. I was completely taken aback. So when the uh, publisher asked me if I wanted to do another book, um, on actually they wanted a more in-depth thing on the Emporium, but I'd sort of dug as deep as I could on that one. And I said, well, I can't, I don't have any more new material on that, but I could do six stores. And I think it was Thomas earlier saying, well, why didn't you do O'Connor and Moffat? Well, I didn't intend this to be comprehensive. Plus I had a word count limit. <laughs> so I picked the six stores I was the most familiar with and that I could find the best stories. This is really the stories of the founders and the stores themselves. It's not about fashion necessarily, although they all had their niches, but it was really about um, uh, the, the families, the immigrant families and old San Francisco. So let's get going here um, with the presentation. I need to make sure this goes. This is um, a little bit of old San Francisco, uh, a reminiscence by um, Frank McDonald. Frank Dunnigan. Okay, please move forward. Come on. Oh, there we go. Uh, this is another San Francisco kid, Frank Dunnigan, and he submitted this, this little um, reminiscence to me. Our family's holiday shopping in the late 50s and early 60s always began with a ride on the El Terravel streetcar. As it slid past Fifth Street and stopped in front of the Emporium, it seemed that most of the passengers disembarked all at once. 
Through the crowded main aisle, we would go as mom and grandma made a few purchases from the notions department before taking the back elevators up to the enormous toy department on the fourth floor. Mom would do her shopping there as grandma took the kids to see Santa and roof rides. From there, we would cross Market Street for lunch at Woolworths and a bit more shopping, often candies, candles, and other holiday items, and then on to see the tree at the city of Paris. While mom and grandma shopped for clothing and gifts, kids insisted on viewing the thousands of ornaments and twinkling lights up close from the balconies on each floor. We then walked to Grand Avenue to see and smell the lavish floral and fur decorations at Podesta Baldaki, ooing and eyeing at the windows at Gump's, and then a bit more shopping at the White House. But walking back to Union Square, there would be a stop in the cosmetics department at iMagnon, while the ladies might pay a visit to the store's lavish lounge. Everybody remembers the fifth floor bathrooms at City of Par at um, iMagnon. If the kids were especially well behaved, there might be a sweet treat from Blum's right next door before heading home. And I always thought that that really uh, encapsulated my memories and these pictures by a variety of um, photographers, mostly just personal pictures, but some of them are um, those ones taken by the professional photographers who were on the streets who um, then tried to sell you the photo afterwards. So Frank Dunnigan kind of sets the same scene. And I have to say, this is an abbreviated version of my longer presentation because of the time we have, but I'm just gonna hit some of the highlights of um, the stores and their founders. So let's go here. Let's talk about San Francisco in the 1850s. Um, as you know, gold was discovered in 48, the word got out by 49, and the world rushed in. We had very little infrastructure. Um, hundreds of thousands of people came. Um, people born in Ireland, Germany, China, and Italy accounted for one of every three San Francisco residents by the end of the 1860s. And that's when the population numbered more than 100,000. So we went from a sleepy little village to um, a town, a city. Um, by 1870s, it was 150,000, and um, it was the largest Jewish population outside of New York City. It was uh, more than 10%. And all those new residents, many with new fortunes, had money to spend and needed household goods and tailors, hatters, dressmakers, uh, and shirt makers. Now, as you probably know, most people did not make money in the gold rush. They made money off the miners. <laughs> Think Levi Strauss, APG and Ninny, uh, Ghirardelli, they made money selling to the miners and the founders of these stores were no different. Hold on. What made a store great? It had to be in a central location served by mass transportation, needed a visible owner who built relationships with the customers and um, employees. It carried a great variety of goods. Um, it offered free services such as deliveries, liberal credit arrangements, and merchandise return privileges. And last but not least, salespeople were there to provide individual attention, something we don't find very often now. This is a picture of the Emporium um, main floor, the jewelry department there. You can see the raised band stand to the left. And they were, they were centered around Union Square. So let's talk about the various entrepreneurs. First of all, you had the Verdier family. Um, the biggest difference between then and now, and I did have the chance to interview Ellen Magna Newman, one of the creative minds behind Joseph Magna, this is Cyril's daughter. Um, and she was a great granddaughter of Mary Ann Magna, founder of iMagna. As she put it, um, the best fertilizer is the foot of the owner on the soil. In every store, the owner was present. If you go to Union Square now, it's mostly um, stores that were founded elsewhere, like Saks Fifth Avenue, Apple. I'm not sure all these are there. I haven't been there in a little bit, but I know it's definitely in transition. But Apple, Tiffany, Macy's, Bulgari, Louis Vuitton, and um, I think Williams Sonoma is still there, but I heard that they were moving. Uh, none are locally owned, although, of course, Williams Sonoma was founded locally. So I'm, as I said, I'm gonna do a quick introduction of each of the main players and a 
brief uh, overview of their um, uh, retail enterprises. So here's Paul Verdier. He was the a descendant of the founders, Emil and Field, Felix Verdier. And he was very present at the city of Paris. Uh, he even had a private dining room for guests located behind the cellars in the store's famed Normandy Lane. Uh, the story goes, the founding of this store had a, a wonderful story behind it. It was the spring of 1850 and the two Verdier brothers, Felix and Emile, sailed from Paris on a, they um, uh, chartered a three mass schooner to come to San Francisco in 1850. And we really had a, no infrastructure in an extremely chaotic port because of the gold rush. So they couldn't find a berth. Word got out that their ship was laden with all these French goods, fine laces, wines, uh, cognac, and San, Francisco's, San Franciscans rowed out and bought all the goods off the ship before they could even get a berth, and they paid with gold dust. So they knew they had a going concern and um, headed back to France to get more goods. So the store survived the earthquake and um, rebuilt on the square and reopened in 1909 and went on for seven more decades on the corner of Geary and Stockton. It really featured uh, clothing for the entire family in the famous Norm Normandy Lane where one could find all things French. Of course, the holidays were a high point. As I said earlier, the tree was a huge attraction. It appeared as if by magic on the morning, at, on the Monday after Thanksgiving, they worked all weekend to get that 35 foot tree decorated. It um, would, traffic would be stopped on Geary Boulevard as the tree was, this was on uh, Friday of Thanksgiving weekend, as the tree was carried wrapped tightly in burlap into the store. And a crew of 20 worked uh, round the clock all Saturday and Sunday night, well, not round the clock, but Saturday and Sunday nights, decorating it with over 5,000 colored glass balls and silver tinsel and gift packages and all sorts of things. So there's a theme here about what happened. The store couldn't compete with chains and changing demographics. They did have some other branches, but they closed in 1972. Um, in my longer presentations, I read this very uh, defiant note from the owners about why they were closing and how they had no debts or, or no, um, they were gonna honor their debts. And it was it's a very proud uh, goodbye to the city. As I'm sure all of you uh, longtime San Franciscans are aware, there was a huge planning fight after the building uh, was sold to Neiman Marcus. Um, a huge one, uh, and uh, the preservationists did not want it uh, changed, but um, Willie Brown represented Neiman Markets and uh, it got a Philip Johnson exterior and they kept some of the interior, but um, it was not well received. Okay, next door, Raphael Weil, the White House. Um, this was actually the first store to close. I'm going in the order of when they opened, but um, this immigrant came to California from Alsace-Lorraine in Northeastern France in 1854. And he quickly worked his way up in the retail trade. Uh, he was very, uh, he was sort of Mr. San Francisco, an early version of, of Cyril Magnon, let's say, who was also officially known as Mr. San Francisco. And uh, Gertrude Atherton recounted in a book she wrote, uh, she said he was a rather stout, short man with a beaming, intelligent face. One rarely entered the White House without meeting him, for he knew all his customers personally and liked to chat with them. I cannot remember how many times he informed me that he had known five generations of my family, but then he liked to divert the conversation to France, to which he was still devoted with his heart, if not his honest and enterprising head. So he was very much the philanthropist. Um, uh, the story goes that after the earthquake, he donated 15,000 items of clothing to people who lost their homes. Um, and they said he did it quietly, but I don't think Raphael Weil ever did anything quietly. He really knew how to use the media. There were more um, uh, newspaper articles devoted to his uh, trips and his 
his returns from France and his birthdays and everything. So that was Raphael Weil. He also he also was a very uh, generous employer. He closed the store, you know, at six. He uh, gave people pay if they went to uh, fight in a war. He was he was well known as a as a, a generous employer. Okay. Here's the store, which you'll all recognize um, at the corner of Sutter and Kearney. Up until a few months ago, we had Banana Republic there in the corner, but that's now another empty storefront. Um, it was designed by Albert, I always get this pronunciation wrong, uh, Pisces, who also did the Emporium and the Mechanics Institute. Um, a fleet of white delivery trucks uh, was went all throughout the city. Uh, delivering goods. The, the store claimed over 28 million packages and the trucks were outfitted to be ambulances if necessary during World War II. In 46, the store let UPS take over citing more efficient service for customers and less traffic congestion. All White House drivers were guaranteed a job at the same salary. So what happened? By the mid 20th century, the store lost its cachet. It had a very inefficient floor plan. It was actually four buildings on the block with four separate leases. And they tried to expand to Oakland and lost $2 million on that um, venture. So after 111 years, it closed in 65. And during the last days, lines went out the door and Pinkerton guards helped control the bedlam. 850 employees were out of a job. Okay, now the Gumps. Um, when I started this book, Gumps was closing. And you know, my intention was just to have stores that didn't exist anymore, but then they kind of revived. And I'll talk a little more about that later. But uh, Solomon Gump arrived in the US in 1850 from Heidelberg, Germany, joining his sister and brother-in-law in San Francisco in six, 1863. He founded S and G Gump with his brother Gustav, and they uh, specialized in large gilded mirrors and huge paintings, which a lot of them hung in bar rooms. So they had many. Uh, they had a steady business because there were so many bar room brawls that these uh, paintings and mirrors got shot up and needed to be replaced. Plus, the new money on Knob Hill wanted art for their mansions. Um, Richard Gump, who's featured here in the pictured here in the lower right, who was president of the store starting in 47, said that it wasn't that Solomon had such great taste in art. The nudes were actually of Solomon's lady friend, a European actress. So uh, Richard's father, A.L. Gump, in the top left there, um, he's the son of, of the founder, Solomon, was the driving force in Gump's reputation as a purveyor of artistic goods from Asia. And he was almost blind. I, I forget if it was um, glaucoma or macular degeneration, but he his tactile senses were very good and he could even tell the quality of jade by feel. And he could be seen in the store wearing uh, his trademark red carnation greeting Gump's customers. Richard was an interesting fellow. He um, was an artist, musician, writer, designer, bon vivant, and uh, a, a lecturer with a good sense of humor. He was conductor of the Guggenheimer Sauerkraut Band. And these, this band wore ill-fitting military uniforms that looked like they were from the Prussian, Franco-Prussian War. And they played off key on purpose. And they played at various charity events around town and even cut a record. Now, when I was growing up, when a young woman from a certain social set got engaged, Gumps was, was where she was supposed to register. Now, when my daughter got married a few years ago, and I mentioned registering, it was all about uh, Etsy and Crate and Barrel. So it, things have definitely changed in that regard. But it was just assumed she'd register for her gifts at, at Gumps uh, because it was the place with the China and the crystal collections uh, and very, very knowledgeable uh, employees. Now, A.L. Gump, when he was working there, Richard's father could be seen greeting customers as the, in the store. And he had a phrase that he liked to use. He'd say, now I really want you to have this. 
one time, story goes that one time he was helping a well-known actress and he used that line on her as she tried on a jade necklace. She said, thank you very much and walked out of the store assuming it was a gift from the benevolent retailer. So I'm not sure um, AL used that uh, much going forward. Um, so here is um, the Post Street location. Um, it has since one of the board members bought the brand and has revived the store in a much smaller uh, format than when it was at 135 post, its last uh, location before moving back to 250 post. Um, it, it really had a, a rocky few decades before supposedly closing in 2018 and reopening. But um, Richard Gump's assistant, uh, she said um, that he went by instinct. He felt that if it was the right thing to do, it was the right thing to do. In my opinion, Mr. Gump's retirement from the store left a void in San Francisco's art and antique circle, and it will never be the same. So um, I don't know if you all saw in the Chronicle, the Sunday Chronicle a couple of weeks ago, Gump's took out a full page letter to the city saying, unless things change downtown, we're gone. So just a little bit of an update there. They're trying is what I'm saying. Okay, the Magnans, here's Marianne and Isaac. Um, they emigrated from Holland in 1875 with their seven children coming around Cape Horn, which was a six month journey and not easy. They first opened a tiny neighborhood store in Oakland, then moved to San Francisco and opened a, a notion store south of market in 1876. Uh, notions are pins and needles and tobacco. Now, Mary Ann was an expert seamstress and she was uh, ambitious in a good way. She uh, was the driving force behind the store, but somehow it had to have Isaac's um, first initial because women, didn't promote themselves, I guess. But now he was an excellent gilder by profession and he worked for the Gumps. But he actually preferred riding his bicycle in Union Square, handing out political tracts. So Knob Hill matrons were the new nobility. They had the money. They were the wives of the mining kings and the lumber barons and the railroad czars. And word spread quickly about Mary Ann's exquisite needlework and soon the store stopped carrying notions and focused on lingerie, shirtwaists, and infants wear. And also the demi-monde of the Barbary Coast rather liked all the specialty uh, needlework. So to Mary Ann, quality was everything. She was a powerful force teaching her children all about the business. And I think as somebody mentioned, there are still magnums in uh, San Francisco, definitely. And uh, a number of them have been on various presentations of mine. So here, the store was in various locations, but in the 40s, it was by the 40s, it was time for a new flagship store. So Grover Magnan, one of Marianne and Isaac's sons, uh, had his eye on this 10-story Butler building at Stockton and Geary, and he hired uh, architect Anthony Fluger, who was known for his uh, beautiful Art Deco work around town. Uh, to do the building. Now, it's it's known as the Marble Lady, uh, and that flat white marble exterior was completely intentional because Grover hated pigeons, and he wanted to make sure they did not have anywhere to hang out on his building. And he said, when I hired architect Tim, Tim Fluger to build this store, I wanted to, him to make it pigeon proof. I live at the St. Francis and I could see what the birds had done to that building. So Magnus has no ledges or cornices where a pigeon can get a toehold. Blums was on the same block, so, so there was no problem getting some coffee crunch cake uh, after uh, shopping. Now Grover was like his mother, obsessed with quality. He would call his top people together and give a little class in quality detection. He'd spread a handful of, let's say, different grade pearl necklaces or uh, alligator skins or, or various items out on the table, turn their tags down and give them a history of these items. And um, he would tell them that where the products came from, and it didn't matter what department you were in, 
they wanted you to know the information about what the goods uh, were that they were selling. He'd say, when you sell a customer a 3,500 Bal Balenciaga or Dior, she has the right to expect reliable counsel on the accessories to go with it. So what happened? Uh, the store merged with Bullocks in 44. It expanded very rapidly, changed hands many times, and the usual story, changing demographics and competition from low price competitors. They had, a, they had a pretty thriving catalog business, but they couldn't make it work and it closed in 1994. Okay, this dapper looking fellow who looks exactly like my cousin Al is actually my great great grandfather F.W. Dorman. And he came from um, Germany in 1862, uh, first in Iowa and then to here. And he, uh, first to Ohio, and he became a merchant specially specializing in China with the Nathan Dorman Company. He, he started the Nathan Dorman Company and he was extremely involved in civic activities. He was a regent at UC. He was involved with the San Francisco Hotel Company which operated the St. Francis Hotel. Um, the Emporium was a different kind of store because it was located what they called south of the slot. Um, the slot was the streetcar tracks on Market Street. So um, it was a riskier area. Union Square was definitely the higher end place and um, it was considered a risky place to have a store. It was first founded by a German immigrant named Adolf Feist. And he leased that parrot building in 835 Market Street in 1893. And he had a lot of small shops in there, but he called it a department store. Um, but it didn't have central management. It, it folded by 1896. And Dorman with some por partners took it over and merged it with the Golden Rule Bazaar and, and launched a um, combined enterprise soon after. It had a lot of separate departments, luxurious amenities, such as an attractive restroom. And um, it was meant to actually appeal to middle-class shoppers, not just the very wealthy. They uh, had a tea room where customers could dine, uh, listen to an orchestra. It was, um, you know, shopping was uh, a way of spending the day. This is before women entered the workforce um, in, uh, in the 70s. So it was, it was a, a thing to do during the day. Now, many native San, Francisco's, <laughs> San Franciscans have fond memories of the Big E. Um, when I went on some Facebook groups, when I was doing my research, uh, the, the, these groups, like I grew up in San Francisco and Baghdad by the Bay, and I posted asking for memories, they just poured in. And they, some of them were really, really fun. Um, people loved Christmas there. Santa was a complete rock star. Um, Peter Hartlub uh, wrote an article in the Chronicle saying um, when Santa, when the Christmas parade happened on the uh, on Market Street. Uh, in terms of crowd size and fervor, it was like a cross between a World Series victory parade and a visit by the Pope. Santa always rode in style, whether it was a horse and carriage in the very early years or the cable car Santa Cade in the 40s and 50s. Tens of thousands of people waited to see Santa arrive. And every year they felt they had to have some, you know, up the game with helium balloons or baby elephant and all sorts of things. So going to the roof rides at um, the Emporium was just what one did at Christmas if you were a kid. And pe many people submitted uh, memories about that. Um, another story I got, which was very funny, was this person uh, bemoaning what his mother made him do in the in the bargain basement that she wanted, they had these big bins of, of flatware at, on sale at, with all these different pat, patterns mixed in. And she made him comb through these bins to find matching patterns of uh, flatware. And, um, and, and, he, and he said, if I, if, if I stabbed you with a fork, you know, other people were doing the same thing. And he said, if I stabbed you with a fork and you had to get a tetanus shot, my apologies. So it was a very different scene than the rarefied uh, environment of the uh, uh, I-Magnon uh, scene. So what happened with the Emporium? Um, Bart, Bart's construction 
the downtown was really hurting and um, the inner city was declining in the 50s and 60s while the suburbs boomed and malls were the wave of the future. Their, the first branch they opened was in Stonestown. And by 1969, when Broadway Hill stores purchased, purchased them, there were 11 branch stores plus the downtown store and the Emporium Capwell in Oakland. They merged with Emporium Capwell in um, 1927 in anticipation of the Bay Bridge opening, which opened in 36. But by 1991, they were burdened by significant debt from too rapid expansion. The Loma Prieta earthquake hit some of the stores in 89 and they really weren't able to uh, keep up with merchandising trends. Um, the building sadly sat empty until 2006 when the Westfield, which is a story unto itself now, uh, a $440 million uh, complex opened after years of negotiation and uh, wrangling. Uh, they saved the dome. And I mean, I could spend a whole other ses session on, on what's going on with downtown now, now but as you all know, I'm sure Nordstrom is pulling out and the Westfield, I believe, is um, giving giving them all back to its its lenders. Um, but as I said, that's, that's a, a whole topic unto itself. Our last store this morning is um, Jay Magnan, Joseph Magnan. Now, Joseph up here on the left was a son of Isaac and Mary Ann. And he was very much schooled in the retail trade, but he figured out that uh, Marianne was not going to give him the president role at iMagnet. So he left in 1913 to start his own store, which really, um, it, it, it kind of, it, it didn't thrive for quite a while. It was hard to get footing. Um, Marianne was not happy that one of her kids took off to create a competing store. And the way Joseph Magdan really got established was because of Cyril, Joseph's son, who's in the lower right here. Cyril figured uh, when World War II was happening and there was a real influx of labor force into the Bay Area, it was there was sort of a youth, a lot more young people with money. And um, Cyril took over the ma management and he wanted to serve a younger market. And he revamped it as the fun place to shop. And it was young and edgy. A perfect example is this lower right picture. They had an in-store boutique, an invitation only called the Wolves Den. And attractive young women served cocktails at uh, two men and the they acted as personal shoppers for the men and they would bring gifts for the men to give to their wives and girlfriends. So this sounds uh, pretty sexist in our current milieu, but um, Mrs. Newman, Ellen Magnan Newman, uh, Cyril's daughter said to me, was actually very practical because if the men bought gifts on their own, it was more likely that they'd be returned. But if these personal shoppers got them brought them to the men, they, they were less returns. So it was considered a practical thing to do. So um, they, uh, they went under, I don't quite have all that information here, but they, they went under as well. They um, were taken over by another store and it wasn't a good cultural fit. The Magnum family all left and the store closed. Herb Cain said, not all that long ago, you could have walked into Bank of America on Montgomery and shaken hands with AP, G, and Innie. Yes, AP in person, sitting at a desk in the middle of the main floor. Grover Magnin would show you around his beloved I Magnin store, the most beautiful in the world, and he meant it. And Cyril Magnin was delighted to wait on you at J Magnin. I or J Magnin's the way, beamed Cyril. There were live gumps at Gumps, Prentice Hale at Hale Brothers, Michelle Weil at the White House, founded by his uncle, and Paul Verdier parading his poodle at the city of Paris or buying you a champagne in Normandy Lane. Their boxes were famous. They became collector's items. Um, this is a collection of Mrs. Newman's here. 
And their their advertising really broke all the rules. They were it was edgy and um, it's actually some of them are in the Smithsonian because they're they're so uh, forward thinking as far as uh, graphics. As I said, by by they had over thirty stores. Uh, this is by nineteen sixty nine, and although they weren't uh, looking to sell, suitors were making offers, and it was actually Amfac who owned Liberty House that took them over. And um, it turned out they turned out to have a much more buttoned up uh, management style than the Magnan family. Um, uh, Cyril called their management style, their own management style, creative anarchy. And um, it didn't it didn't work. So um, it closed in 1984. Cyril said about um, said to one of the Amfac executives, Joseph Magnan is like a finely tuned clock. And if you start playing with it, it's going to stop ticking. So it's tempting to pay, play the if only game. Um, if only the next generation, the families who founded the old stores had been interested in continuing the uh, tradition or hadn't sold to a corporate entity that changed the character. If only they hadn't expanded so quickly, depleting cash. If only real estate in San Francisco hadn't gotten so pricey. And of course, <laughs> The pandemic, Amazon, I mean, department stores are are in are hurting everywhere except maybe Harrods. They seem to have, and some of the Japanese stores. They they have um, managed to uh, survive, but um, the traditional department store um, seems to no longer have a place in the retail uh, panorama. Um, so this is something I wanted to mention to you. I don't want to take up too much more time. Um, a very exciting uh, exhibit is going to be uh, opening this coming January at the De Young. It's called Fashioning San Francisco, A Century of Style. It's done by the same curators who did the Guao Pei exhibit out at the Legion of Honor, which was wonderful. And this uh, exhibit is showcasing their collection of 20th and 24th first um, fashion that they have. And it's mostly, uh, I'd say, I don't know a percentage, let's say 70% from iMagnon. And I was thrilled to be asked to write an essay for the catalog. And I just approved the proofs this week. And I'm very excited that this exhibit is happening. Plus, I got to go into the bowels of the de Young and look at their collection with the curators, which was a lot of fun. So that pretty much wraps up my um, talk today. If you are interested in the book, um, it's available. I don't know how, I mean, bookstores, it's always, I, I can't guarantee that it's gonna be in a bookstore, but you could always go to History Press or any of these other um, places. I guess that's it for me if anybody has questions.